wanted to touch on something today that, and let me ask you guys, because I just asked producers here. When you hear uh, chemical imbalance, what do you think? You know, it means something different to every person. And I started to go the wrong way with this before I studied it. Chemical imbalance to many uh, means brain. The one thing a doctor will tell you, well, I don't know what's causing it, this autism, this depression, this sleeplessness or sleepiness. Uh, but I think you probably have a chemical imbalance. And I thought, wait a minute, isn't chemical imbalance, don't we do SMAC tests, S-M-A-C, chemistry 24, chemistry 7 tests? So I looked that up. <clears throat> the test known, test uh, SMAC test is known by several names, including SMAC 7, sequential multi-channel analysis, or SMAC, with computer, a metabolic panel, basic metabolic panel. And I thought, well, wait a minute, these are blood chemistries, or so I learned in the Navy, you know, 50 years ago. Um, these are blood chemistries, so when a doctor tells us we have a, a chemical imbalance, would that give rise to diabetes? Uh, would that give rise to tumors in our body? Or would that give rise to arthritis if we have a chemical imbalance? Listen to this. There's a guy named Fred Bauman. He wrote this he's got on a website. Um, he wrote this. It was in uh, PLOS, which is a growingly respected uh, uh, news journal. I really like it. Cray, I'll see you later. The twins called. They can't come home till later. I did that for Brittany. I did. Cray, for you guys who don't know, Cray is uh, one of our dear, dear editors. Very smart guy. Filmographer. He graduated from film school. Very handsome young man. And uh, he's dating a woman he really cares for, Brittany. And so every time he leaves, you'll hear me say, uh, hey, the twins called or Linda called, you know, just to make fun of him. I hope Brittany forgives me for that. Yeah, <laughs> she will. Have a safe drive home. Okay, um, so now back to this, right? Chemical imbalance, what in the world does that mean? <clears throat> too much, says cancer.gov. Too much or too little of any substance that helps the body work the way it should. Hyper or hypothyroid. Too much or too little. A chemical imbalance may be caused by certain tumors. Of course, this is cancer.gov. Certain tumors that can uh, cause changes in behavior or emotion. So all of a sudden, you begin to think, okay, cancers, diabetes, disease. But then I start thinking brain because I read this, PLOS 2006, <clears throat> a guy named Fred Bauman. In 1948, neuropsychiatry. I used to lecture to neuropsychiatrists in my early days, in the 1970s, when I began to study food allergy. What I didn't know back then, I now know, food allergy is kind of a moot point because gut permeability is the real etiology of the problem. Don't let egg and corn and wheat and sugar slip through and you won't be allergic, seal up the gut. But I didn't know that back then. I used to lecture to uh, orthomolecular neuropsychiatrists, Alan Cott, Harvey Ross, all these great, great guys. But this guy Bauman says, in 1948, neuropsychiatry was divided into neurology dealing with diseases, and psychiatry dealing with emotions and behaviors. Psychiatric drugs appeared in the late 50s. Psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry authored chemical imbalances. It was a marketing strategy. They would call all things uh, psychological chemical imbalances, needing their pills, which were called chemical balancers. So marketing and pharmaceutical companies don't ever, don't ever think these aren't brilliant marketers. Because 1948, I was born in 1949. So it's really fascinating. A year before I was born, ta-da, chemical imbalances became the mainstay. And it was all a drug marketing ploy. What is a chemical imbalance? I know what a blood chemistry test is. We can do cholesterol, sugar, uric acid, you know, all sorts of things with a chem panel. But I didn't know how it dovetailed into this. <clears throat> so many of you, I wonder with a show of hands, how many of you have heard well, that's nothing, Linda. That's just a chemical imbalance. I was fascinated with Jordan helping me write today's show. He pulled up an article that said, a chemical imbalance really doesn't mean anything. You're not chemically imbalanced. Uh, you may be metabolically imbalanced, contributing to depression or any number of uh, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. Metabolism is a little bit different than chemistry, though. I pulled up, so what does, okay, 
if indeed metabolic uh, dysfunction occurs in the brain, in the thyroid, you know, in the gonads, anywhere, if indeed, okay, so let me back up a little. Metabolism, um, it, obviously we all have metabolism. We have endocrine systems. Endocrine systems make hormones. Hormone disruptors, few doctors know, are something called mycotoxins, several classes of fungal metabolites. Fungi make these as natural secondary metabolites. Uh, one of them, let's talk about aspergillus. It might be in our air duct, HVAC. It's very, well, it's not in here. We had it tested, but it <clears throat> might be at home. Uh, aspergillus mold makes a secondary product called aflatoxin. It makes several of them. Aflatoxin B1 is known, I hope you're sitting down, is known to cause human cancer. Your doctor doesn't know that. When I get up and teach physicians this or teach the lay public this, the mouths, how are we getting into mycotoxins? Okay, here you go. This is called Prostate Cancer Hope at Last. Let me just read you a page here. Here it is right here. Three doctors of the World Health Organization wrote this book, Prostate Cancer, Hope at Last. They wrote one, Breast Cancer, Hope at Last. Atherosclerosis, Hope at Last. One of these guys was my buddy, Dr. A.V. Costantini. <clears throat> Are penicillin and other antibiotics carcinogenic in humans? Hold on, can penicillin cause cancer? Certainly physicians would not believe such a risk exists for penicillin, an antibiotic given to billions of humans. However, it is by definition a fungal metabolite, a, a mycotoxin, and mycotoxins do cause cancer. This was written 20 years ago. In the past 10 years, we have discovered that mycotoxins, we're talking about chemical imbalances. I mean, th this is, to me, this is the very root of chemical imbalances, these mycotoxins, so we need to spend a little time on them. They're endocrine disruptors. <clears throat> so, antibiotics, as endocrine disruptors. Uh, antibiotics are mycotoxins. But there's an endocrine disruptor that I think is overwhelmingly leading to horrible, horrible problems. For example, I had a mom write me today. I met her at one of the meetings last year. I don't recall her, but I must have given her my email. And she said, Doug, my name is, <clears throat> gave me her name. And she said, I have an 11-year-old daughter who is uh, developing very rapidly. We call this precocious puberty. And we all scratch our heads and say, wait a minute, 11 years old, wasn't it 13, 14, 15 years old, boys and girls? Boys' voice would change, hair would grow in their bodies, you know, and so forth. Now at my age, it's all falling out. <clears throat> Folks, when we talk about precocious puberty, I can think of no other mycotoxin fungus that is in our diet very commonly that causes it they have studied animals thoroughly, and precocious or premature puberty is induced by a mycotoxin that grows in corn and wheat, our grain supply. It's called xerelinone. Xerelinone. Xerelinone is an endocrine disruptor. Why? This one's really bad. When your hormones get shut off, ladies, when your estrogen gets shut off, you don't want to make new estrogen, right? God shuts it off. That's cool. You might go through hot flashes or some of those things, but after that, you know, peace to you. It's, it's good. But this xerelinone uh, is a fusarium, uh, fusarium fungus mycotoxin. And xerelinone is suspected as being carcinogenic, but it mimics human estrogen. Who wants human estrogen? Who wants a lot of... Have they linked that to breast cancer and all sorts of things? What are estrogen receptive breast cancers? 70, 80, 90 percent of all diagnosed breast cancers now are estrogen receptor positive. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means somewhere, ladies, lots of estrogen is coming into your life stream. If you're not making it, how are you getting it? Xerelinone has another name. It's called xeranol. Xeranol is synthetic xerelinone. Who would want to synthesize a fungal poison? Why would that be important? About 28, 30 years ago, the dairy industry, upon pressures from us, you see, we were telling McDonald's and everybody, we will not eat antibiotics anymore. We don't want those cows to be force-fed antibiotics, and you do it for one reason only. Antibiotics are growth promoters. Any shock, 
that little kids who took tons of antibiotics are now 30, 40 years old and they're obese? Does that shock any of you? Antibiotics are growth promoters. We don't let cows live 30 or 40 years. We kill them at seven months, 12 months, something like that. So we didn't know that they ferment and ferment and ferment and ferment and boom. Xerelinone is called Xeranol. Along comes a pharmaceutical company and changes the name to Ralgro, R-A-L-G-R-O. Ralgro is in American meat and lamb. In addition to it growing, thank you, John. In addition to Ralgro, uh, or to Ralgro, to Xerelinone, its other name, right? Um, growing on our corn and wheat and so forth, some of our crops, uh, at which these cows and sheep, you know, lambs and chickens go out and eat uh, the corn and so forth. Now we're giving uh, a non-steroidal drug to induce weight gain to cows. And it's xerelinone, it's xeranol. It's more potent than the mycotoxin itself. So the one thing I'm gonna write this mother and say, you know what, tell me about milk, tell me about cereal, tell me about hamburgers or meat or steak or lamb burgers in your daughter's diet. And here's what I'm gonna hear. She drinks milk every day, we encourage it. Why her doctor said you have to have milk. Can we find trace amounts of xeranol in milk? The FDA said 30 years ago or something, I was perfectly safe. But you know my feeling on that, folks. What well, might have been perfectly safe, <clears throat> I still think it is. If she drinks a glass of milk, eight ounce glass a week, probably safe. Who does that? Don't we eat lots of meat, <clears throat> and we're buying lean meat, you know, doesn't make any difference. It's still, if it's not grass finished, grass fed, if you don't have a little local farm, we have slankers out here, Ted Slankers, slanker grass fed meat, which I eat. If you don't have that near you, you might want to find it. If you're concerned, if you're seeing your you know, eight-year-old boys walking in the living room saying, hello, mom, hello, dad, nice to see you. Got a football game tonight. Okay, there might be something wrong. We're precociously going into puberty. We're, we're uh, pushing the envelope. Why? It's really, folks, we are, uh, we are chemically imbalanced. That's a name, 1948, developed by drug companies. Because we started seeing, do you think it's shocking that 1948 antibiotics come on the market and 1948 antidepressants come on the market? I mean, and we, we go back and look at obesity or, or morbid weight gain, and we see that 1950s, my wife and I love <clears throat> Turner Classic Media, old movies, you know, Cary Grant, we love those things, and nobody in those towns or on those ships or in those train depots were overweight, only the banker, right? Because he had lots of money, and he could drink fine booze and smoke great cigarettes. Cigars. <clears throat> so understand, we're getting into these chemical imbalancers. We call them endocrine disruptors. Your endocrine system makes hormones. What disrupts it? so well documented, we're now thinking candida albicans. Let me read something to you here that I put up on the screen. This comes out of sciencealert.com. Listen to this headline. Yeast infections have been linked to mental illness. Could thrush be messing with our brains? Circa May 5, 2016. Yeast infections are a relatively common occurrence these days and are easily treatable. But new research has just revealed a tentative link between the fungus Candida albicans and schizophrenia in men and memory impairment in mentally ill women, which suggests this kind of infection might have a longer lasting impact on the body than was previously thought. 1977. There was a tremendous article in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It said that vaginal yeast uh, hangs into the reservoir, into the vag uh, the reservoir, the vaginal tract. But unless you fix it, 100% of the women studied 1977 had gut yeast. Women with chronic vaginal yeast problems, they said all had gut yeast. So unless you get rid of it here, you're not going to get rid of it elsewhere. 
And I don't think yeast infections are limited to women. I think, we, I think prostatitis is a yeast infection of men. Okay, so when you talk about chemical imbalances, um, it's really fascinating, folks. Autism, you know, we blame vaccinations, we blame everything on autism. Do we really know the cause? Uh, there was a guy named Lombard who wrote a book. Darn, I should have brought it over here. I think it's over there on the shelf. <clears throat> brain, something about brain and children. He dedicated a chapter and he said he was out at a uh, big university. He was a neurologist, not Columbia. Oh, I forget. He said, I and other researchers have given autistic children the drug Nystatin. And the results were simply overwhelming. Nystatin only does one thing. Nystatin kills yeast. You're telling me these autistic children somehow got into yeast? Folks, we started something I thought was kind of twisted a few years ago. When we don't sell all these antibiotics for cows and chickens and pigs and so forth, we got to get rid of them somewhere. Why all of a sudden did every pregnant woman go on antibiotics? And now, by the way, they're all tested for diabetes. How smart is that of the drug companies? Gestational diabetes. Oh, you need to be on these shots the rest of your life. I'm telling you, just uh, we've made pregnancy a disease. We can test mom for all sorts of things. We can even test cord blood for her unborn child that one day, maybe next year, we can start on drugs. It's kind of exciting, you know, for the pharmaceutical industry. Not at all exciting for those of us who feel we are being imposed upon by some of these things that's going on today. So just understand, I think things in medicine are a little bit mixed up today. I think when we hear chemical imbalance, that's a way of saying we have no idea. In medicine, we say etiology unknown. How many charts? Half of them, three quarters of them in America. Yep, Linda's got an elbow that's swollen, her hip's real sore, uh, she's getting migraine headaches, etiology unknown. That means we have no idea why. But one, two, three drugs I can give her. I know I'm being cynical, I know it's not really that bad, but I'm deeply concerned what's going on in America today. Our wisest, our young, bright, 28-year-old medical school graduates learn to do this. They learn to prescribe and prescribe and prescribe and prescribe. And as long as they prescribe, everybody's happy, except perhaps the patients. I think it's coming to the point where we're beginning to want more and more information, proper diet, is it the keto diet? Is it the paleo diet? Is it the Mediterranean diet? Is it the Kaufman diet? There's a diet named after me. Um, we have a saying in Texas that you must adhere to since I'm in Texas, and that is when you find a good horse, you must ride it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is your turn to ask questions. I just wonder if you could tell John, when you hear chemical imbalance, do you think whole body? I think diabetes is a chemical imbalance. Or did you think, uh, like John did and I didn't, that chemical imbalance is here? See, I haven't been to a doctor, uh, you know, in a long, I, I got sick last Christmas and got an antibiotic. I took it for a few days and I started shaking, so I stopped taking it. And I went to more natural things and it just cleared up. I don't recommend you do that, by the way, uh, but I was very fortunate. Okay, this is Keith, my FUPO buddy, fungus until proven otherwise. Hey, Doug, I've been taking resveratrol for the past three months, and I'm experiencing arthritic pain in my neck and lower back. Had the same experience years ago. Did some research, and I noticed that this uh, is a side effect for some. I love the benefits I get from it, especially with my skin. Yeah, many people say that. It can reverse fine wrinkles on the skin and so forth. I was wondering if there's uh, something else I can take that has similar benefits. You might uh, Thank you, my friend, always fungus until proven. Otherwise, Keith. Um, Keith, uh, grape seed extract has a lot of the same properties. Resveratrol, folks, is why uh, purple wine is purple. It's the color of the grape skin. And scientists long ago began analyzing the grape skin and going, holy cow, this is what keeps purple grapes from getting a fungal infection. Resveratrol is hugely antifungal. Keith, sometimes we, if we're excited about a supplement, and man, I've been there with garlic and a bunch of them, we tend to overdo it a little. 
maybe a resveratrol would be cardioprotective and skin therapeutic at a dose of a quarter of what you're taking. If you're looking for good skin, uh, grape seed extract has been noted. I, I lectured John many years ago to a woman's group out here in uh, Texas, there's probably two, 300 women there. And one of them raised her hand and said, you know, what do we do about this? At the time, I'm 40 years old. You know, I didn't know what all this was. Now I live it. Um, I said, what are you referring to? The skin, the skin that falls down. Okay, well, um, take a look at a couple of studies. Go into your computer and type in grape fruit or grape seed, not grapefruit, grape seed extract. And sure enough, it adds a tightening element to skin over an extended period of time. I don't, Keith's probably too young, he's a fireman. That's it's probably not what he's concerned about. He's probably looking at the anti-candida, anti-fusarium, you know, benefits of this supplement. I, Keith, let me give you one suggestion. We used to tell people at the hospital when we'd put them on antifungal drugs, you may go through a little die off. What you may be experiencing is really good dormant arthritic conditions come into the surface now. You're pushing them out. Do I think arthritis is a yeast problem? I sure do in many cases. So you just might, here's what I'd do if I were you. Thank you, sir. Here's what I'd do if I were you. Uh, oh, thank you. Wow, that's kind of cool. YouTube, we're on YouTube today. Yeah. yeah, okay, YouTube and Facebook. We bought one of those $100 million connectors and we can talk to both of you guys now. Okay, I'll answer that too. Good for her. Um, just know that sometimes when we take some supplements, um, you can get to the point where they're very therapeutic. Vitamin C, B vitamins, niacin, cyanocobalamin, these great, great vitamins, grapeseed extract. And if we take too many, I think dormant yeast problems begin to surface. So Keith, I don't know how old you are. Let's say you're 40. When you were 60, you might have had a heck of a problem with arthritis. Right now, a little bit, and you may be bringing it to the surface with an anti-yeast supplement called resveratrol. Uh, short of that, I'd drop that. I'd see if in a week the pain doesn't go away. And if you're looking for skin results, I would try grape seed extract. My good buddy Keith. Hey, thank you, Keith, for all you do. I was in a restaurant the other day with John, and there were like a dozen policemen sitting in there. Uh, and we see them all the time out here locally, and, and uh, we bought their lunch. Um, you know, it's just, it's so amazing to me. The, it makes me so sad to see what's going on in America today. And this, this uh, loss of life by policemen really is something, as a military veteran, uh, something I really take exception to. I mean, they're targets for many people, and that really angers me. Um, Okay, Jackie, my son just got out of the hospital. He's said to have heart issues at first. Now it's been said he has too much acid in his blood. Can you share what the heck this is? Uh, Jackie, what did they say? Let me tell you what I do to stabilize this. So his body is acidic. His blood is acidic. What makes it more alkaline? Hospital food will make it acidic. <laughs> what makes it more alkaline? Chlorophyll sodium bicarbonate. Uh, greens will help, like juicing spinach and kale and green apples. That should really help him too. Grains contribute, greens help when you're acid, when you want to go alkaline. Uh, so I would use, there's a product called, oh, chlorophyll drops. I forget, oxychlor, oxychlor. We keep it at home. We put it in the cat's bowl and so forth. Um, and uh, I would use, you know, he's a young man out of the hospital, da, 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 too much acid in his blood. Can you share what the heck that is? Yeah, he, we can test our pH, our urine, our saliva, and so forth. In the hospital, they can test the pH. So he's probably down around 5.5, 6, his blood. Uh, and I don't think a hospital would know how to help with this. What I might do is begin taking chlorophyll drops, 7, 10 drops, a couple times a day in a glass of water and see if when he goes back to the doctor and they test his blood again, see if he isn't back up around seven. Uh, that's what I would do, but I wouldn't go back to potatoes and cereal and milk and soda pop and so forth. You know where I'm going with this because sugar is a grain and grains contribute to a higher uh, acid environment inside your body, whereas greens contribute to more balancing, more alkaline. 
Uh, thank you, Jackie. I see your name in here all the time. Let's go to our friends on YouTube. This is so great. Number one, friends on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Tell your friends about this, please. And by the way, why do I do this? Uh, next week, it'll be 50 years on Thursday that I went into boot camp. I was one of those unfortunate ones who got drafted and uh, ended up in the Vietnam War. And, uh, but I came home. I'm one of the very fortunate ones that came home. And uh, I have learned, I came home sick. And all the king's drugs and all the king's medicines and all the king's therapies wouldn't help me. One day, Dr. Hughes at USC Medical School in California, where I was helping him, uh, he said, you know, you were in Vietnam. Maybe there's a parasite on board. And so I went to the library. We didn't have Google searches. I went to the library, got a library book, and it fell open, I kid you not, to a chapter like 11, 1953 parasitology book that fell open to a chapter that said, yeast and fungus parasitize man. And I thought, I got the jungle rod growing all over my arms and my legs. Could that stuff, it's called a mycobacterium, could that stuff gain access to my bloodstream, the inside of my body? You bet it could, transdermally. On top of that, I'm 21 years old. I'm home from Vietnam, and in California where I lived, you could drink beer legally. You add the beer on top of the jungle rot, and you got a real fermenting interior in your body. Um, so you got to be careful out there. Uh, so, uh, hair salon Lisa. That's cool. So how do you balance out the microbiome after one is having issues and took antibiotics off and on for years? Really good question. Uh, Lisa, the one thing I have found through the years, and this was really dealing with women who were going through menopause. This was 40 years ago. I wasn't a woman. I didn't know why they were sitting there sweating on my desk. I couldn't understand it. I found out that sometimes a little progest cream, wild Mexican yam, uh, other supplements, black cohosh, might help women with that problem. And I found that they all represented, in a month or two when I was working with them nutritionally, I found out they all represent a thumbprint. Black cohosh worked for Sally. Wild Mexican yam, uh, transdermally, worked for Linda. And everybody had their own. One black cohosh, 11 black cohoshes, okay? Same when we're trying to regenerate the mycobiome. Myco means fungus. In that mycobiome is the microbiome. We now know that 70 to 80 percent of our whole immune system is right there. And man, we were throwing junk and alcohol and, you know, peanuts contaminated with these mycotoxins, medications, antibiotics, aspirin in there without really understanding that. We are going to begin winning in clinical medicine when our gastroenterologists understand that 70 percent of our immune system is right there. We better treat it good. Um, so I would start with a good probiotic. I would get a plain goat yogurt, good source of the good bacteria. Um, I read an article in the paper the other day that most of the yogurt, and who didn't know this, most of the yogurt in stores, even health food stores, are riddled with sugar, lots of sugar. You're almost contributing to your own imbalance of the microbiome when you add sugar on top of the good bacteria. Try a product, try, and I'm gonna disclose, I always do, try Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, a living bacteria that you swallow, maybe a couple of them tonight before you go to bed. I will tell you what I just told our secretary over here. She came, uh, you know, her husband's having some health problems. She bought a couple of things. She brought it to me to look at. No matter how dilute, even if it's homeopathy, homeopathy still can have a big impact, as some of you guys know. Start with a half a dose for a day or two and then go up. Same with probiotics. Start with a little bit. You may not feel much, but boy, on day three, you're really going to feel it. And then remember, it isn't just replenishing bacteria in the gut. It's changing your diet. Don't, you know, they say don't drink alcohol for a reason when you're taking uh, probiotics. Uh, alcohol is the mycotoxin of brewer's yeast. So it's called ethanol or, or alcohol. Um, so don't pour the fire in on top of the now replenished good bacteria. I think the reason we're seeing, Lisa, so many gut problems, bloating, belching, gas, constipation, diarrhea, <gasps> GERD, there's a hundred different now gut problems. I think we're seeing an explosion of them because 60 years ago, our loving moms took us to loving pediatricians and they finally had something. 
and they weren't going to let go of it. Sadly, they're not letting go of it today, and we are seeing an explosion of antibiotic resistance due to doctors to this day handing you an antibiotic. Uh, they've got to learn to slow down here and ask for the etiology. If I were a doctor, I would test every patient that came in for fungus and bacteria. I call you in a couple of days. I'm going to run some tests, right? Nasal secretions, cough, sputum, you know, ears, etc. And uh, I'll get back with you in a couple of days because I think we are handing them antibiotics claiming there's no side effects to penicillin. Really? Antibiotics are now linked. Increased doses are linked to increased incidence of breast, colorectal, lung, uh, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and prostate cancer. Five of the most common cancers are linked to antibiotics, and they're throwing them at our kids and us. Be strong enough, folks, to ask your doctor if you can try homeopathy, if you can try colloidal silver, if you can try black curant or resveratrol, uh, or if you can try natural antibiotics first. You go to the doctor to say, how progressed is this? I know her fever is 101. Uh, can I give her some miso soup? Can I make her some things that might be very therapeutic? Maybe a little carrot juice with falcarinol. One of the great antifungals is hidden in carrot. Um, you know, could I use things like that, doctor, before? I'll take the antibiotic prescription, and if it goes up to 102, 103 tonight, I'll give her a tepid sponge bath uh, and start her on the antibiotics. But I just think, folks, we need to think through all of these reasons that they're giving us to take antibiotics. Find out what your thumbprint is. Start on a good probiotic, Lisa, and then most importantly, to fix the microbiome, you must change the microbiome. Like I said earlier, greens contribute to good health, grains maybe not. And we didn't know this. You remember 35 years ago, the pyramid, the food pyramid, upside down was all grains, six, seven servings of grain a day. And once again, our friends on YouTube, Jenny, do you think by supplementing it helps? Helps to balance and heal our gut, uh, like taking probiotics. Boy, Jenny, there's two sides to that coin. My peers, I have a lot of doctor friends, and I speak at some of these symposiums, and what I hear all the time is, eh, if you're eating good food, you probably don't need to supplement. So that begs the question, the other group of my friends, the researchers, uh, say, and that is, really, Doc, where was that apple tree? What kind of soil was that grown in? Was it grown in good soil or bad soil? Are we really ruining our food due to some of the manures in it and so forth? Oh, that, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah, we didn't even say we were telling anybody we were wrong. Yeah, that's kind of a lot of questions from Facebook today. Good for you guys. My goal, by the way, I'm not selling you anything. I'm here to teach you what's in here because if one day I die, my old producer and I, he's 71, I'm 69 just about, and uh, uh, we're going to be gone one day. And so we wanted to plant a seed here. A little crude, but I'm standing at a urinal at lunch in the men's room, and they have these placards, these signs up. And I've just got to share something with you because I thought it was so funny. I took a picture with my cell phone. And now, John, I'm going to have a problem even reading that now. I, could, I guess I could look on my phone. What's it say? I can't hear. I guess I could have pulled my phone out. Okay, let me just tell you. This was staring me in the face, this cute little dog, and it's a pitch for all of you with, what is it, diabetes, John? Yeah, it's a pitch for all of you who haven't found out you have diabetes yet, and there's 60 million of you who don't know what's wrong with you. Why aren't you in the doctor tomorrow morning? Why don't you drink a big gulp, go to the doctor and have them test and see if you have diabetes? And then down at the bottom, it's the Ad Council, see those little things? It's the American Medical Association, it's the American Diabetic Association, and it's the American Pharmaceutical Association. Who's paying for this ad? Get them in to see the doctor, because once they're there, we can draw a little more blood and test their cholesterol. <gasps> 202, you're gonna die. I've had a 240 cholesterol for as many years as I can remember. I'm not swallowing a statin drug. Candidly, I'm one of the rare people that would prefer dying than taking drugs that blow out my muscles and hurt my health. Um, so at any rate, this sign just kind of blew me away. Okay. 
Okay, where was this? Okay, Dr. K, thank you, Kel. I'm not a doctor. You're not leaving us, Clay, are you? Oh, wow, I'm sorry. I'll talk to you later, thanks. Um, I am not a doctor. I worked in clinical nutrition uh, clinics, hospitals for 22 years, and then I've been doing media work for a long time since. I am a, a war veteran. I worked in emergency room, emergency medicine, uh, war medicine, and operating rooms, and so forth. And I saw a lot of things, and that captivated my interest to have me go on and study mycology. I think fungus is a huge problem. But thank you, I'm, I'm not. Doug, Doug is the right name. What's your stance about probiotics? So YouTube really wants to know, is it more beneficial to outnumber the yeast with these or try to lower the yeast instead? Okay, and the other one, other question I had, do, 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 do. where'd that one go? Here it is, Jenny. Do you think by supplementing it helps? Helps to balance, heal our guts, it, like taking probiotics. I don't think there was a need for probiotics until Fleming, in his laboratory in 1928, discovered antibiotics. Simply put, folks, we didn't know. We didn't know probably till the 70s that we even had good bacteria. Doctors graduating from medical school were told it was all bad. You walk into a hospital today, you're putting kill bacteria all over your skin. Look at some of the nurses and some of the doctors' hands. You gotta leave the bacteria there. When you swallow an antibiotic, what is it? It's an indiscriminate bacteria killer. It doesn't care if it's a good guy or bad guy. Thank God it's a poison It's made by fungus. It's a poison that kills the bad guys, but it also kills the good guys. Here's the good news. God put like three pounds of it in there, and it only kills trace amounts. But bacteria and yeast compete for a food supply when we're born, lining our mucous membrane tissue, right? Without the bacteria there, the yeast can become hyperactive, poke a hole. It's called, um, they, they gain these threads, mycelium, and it can poke a hole in the lumen, the lining of the intestine. Next thing you know, you got food allergy. I could eat wheat and corn and drink milk and eat eggs, and now I can't. I feel miserable. That's because you're launching an immune response, little holes in the gut. Antibiotics, one of the greatest inventions of all time, and I would have told you 40 years ago that they've saved millions of people. I'm telling you now, I think they're taking huge numbers of people out. People who are on prophylactic antibiotics, and guys, sometimes you have to. You have bacteria growing. You're so chemically imbalanced. You have bacteria and fungus growing throughout your body, and your doctor's best choice is to put you on antimicrobials. Your job is to understand how in control of that car you are. We turn our car over to a mechanic for an oil change at 3,000 miles. We turn our body over to a doctor, as women more than men, but very, very often. You have to understand that doctors didn't learn mycology and medical training. They don't know about fungus, vaginal yeast, ringworm, jock itch, toenail fungus, you know, uh, uh, dandruff, et cetera. It's called seborrheic dermatitis. But they don't know that yeast grows in lumps and it mimics cancer, especially in the lungs. If you're living in a moldy home, you go to the doctor, he takes an x-ray and he says, oh no, you have lung cancer. Really, doc? Do me a favor. Put a little needle in, pull some of the cells out, and take it to mycology department, not cancer department, not oncology. Get it tested for fungus because cancer, I'm sorry, uh, fungus protects itself from our white blood cells by encapsulating itself in a sac, and it cannot be differentiated from a cancer tumor. I published in this area, uh, and it's a huge eye opener. So, when we talk about antibiotics contributing to very bad diseases, we must first think of the gut where the destruction starts. If you've been on lots of antibiotics and you now, and when you were 12 years old for acne, and you're now 35 or 45 or 55, and you now experience bloating, belching, gas, constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, you know, all these uh, problems, I would use probiotics and a changed diet uh, like I use oxygen. I mean, that to me is very, very logical. It isn't 
to a gastroenterologist. Well, you got to try this pill and this pill and this pill and this pill and keep coming back and then this pill and this pill, a lifetime of medications. Folks, you are free the moment you liberate yourself from running from doctor to doctor and figure out your own problems. I'm not telling you to do that because that could be life-threatening if you're not watching this show, other shows like it, and reading and most importantly learning about your own body. I have fixed almost all of my own problems myself, but I've got a 50-year background in this, okay? Go slow. Vitamins are a good idea. Probiotics are a good idea. Um, if you need them, take them. Which one? Find your thumbprint. Find your thumbprint. But there's no sense in swallowing. You are not what you eat. You are what you digest. And if you've got holes in the intestine, um, you know, you are what you absorb. It's that simple. If you want, you know, if you want good vitamins and you're eating the good fruits and vegetables, but you have a quarter inch thick plaque on the intestine from all the alcohol, all the pills, birth control pills, etc., it's not going to absorb anything. It doesn't matter how much vitamin C you take in capsule form, it's not going to absorb. A good probiotic, a change diet, a sweating program, far infrared sauna, things of that sort, clean water should really help. Um, Okay. What did we use to fight infection wounds before? Yeah, that'll do. Thanks, John. Uh, what did we use to fight infection wounds before antibiotics? I know someone with a problem that doesn't want to go to a doctor. And, well, we use sulfa drugs, S U L F A. By the way, can I tell you guys? We were told this in our training before we went to Vietnam. Um, World War II? In my medical pack, I carried uh, two glass bottles for IVs. They were heavy, filled with liquid, uh, normal saline. IV cords, morphine, aspirin, you know, allergy pills, et cetera, in my medical pack. In World War II, they carried honey. They carried honey. Honey, and especially Manuka honey. Now, it's expensive. You're going to pay, you know, for a little, this is my tea, but... A little jar like that's going to be $75, $85. Ooh, don't use much of it, a little tiny bit. Some Manuka honeys are actually what we call therapeutic honey. Their antimicrobial activity is so high, it's absolutely incredible. So if you enjoy a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, you'll use about half as much, uh, but it is antimicrobial. So they use sulfa drugs before there were antibiotic drugs, and before that, um, we used honey. We use natural things, borax. I mean, it's amazing the antimicrobial properties of some of the chemicals that, that we used to use. He does want to go to a doctor and get antibiotics carry. Have him look today at a silver held in suspension, shaved silver. You can't even see it. Um, when you guys were little, did you have one of those Christmas things that you shake it up in the snow? Remember those things? Colloidal silver doesn't need to be shaken up. It's held in suspension in the liquid. And silver, you've heard of people taking gold shots for arthritis, and it really seems to help. Uh, some of these uh, minerals or metals are very, very therapeutic and very, very dilute. Think homeopathy, like for like. Very, very dilute silver or called colloidal silver. Smoke <sighs> is a colloid held in suspension up there, right, till it dissolves. So colloidal silver is what I would recommend, Carrie. I would probably get two different kinds. Remember, I'm a guy that says everybody represents a thumbprint. Gee, those 11 people did well on this colloidal silver. I'm going to get two just in case I'm the 12th that doesn't do well on that one. I'm going to begin rotating some of these things. If we don't know if it's bacterial, if it could be viral, if it could be fungal, I like olive leaf extract. It's, a, it's an indiscriminate antimicrobial, not antifungal, not antibacterial, not antiviral, antimicrobial. If there's a germ, olive leaf extract really helps take care of it. And then don't rule out a teaspoon of virgin cold-pressed olive oil a couple times a day. Um, and I want to caution you, Carrie. You're smart. I know. I've seen you in here before. Um, always recommend folks, uh, look, a, a doctor visit can be life-saving. Uh, if he really has a, an advanced, oh, he's got infected wounds, um, uh, aloe directly from the plant, the, the, the milk in aloe, the thick, clear stuff. Um, 
but it wouldn't be a bad idea. Folks, look, they're just human. They're just like us. They're under orders from the pharmaceutical industry, and they don't know that, to sell lots and lots and lots. You can always say no. Be a big boy or a big girl. And so I came in here and made an appointment. It's a doc in the box. I paid 75 bucks. Look at this. What do you think, doc? Ooh, man. Jim, I'm glad you got in here. I want to do something. I want to debreed it. I want to suture it up. I'm going to put it back. This thing could have killed you, man. Your money would be wisely spent that way. So don't be foolish not to let a doctor look at it. Um, you can always say no if you don't agree, but at least you've got a medical opinion. Thanks, Carrie, for caring for him. Uh, three appointments on Tuesday, so missed the show and haven't caught up yet. However, got to share FUPO with all of them, all three appointments. <laughs> Good for Beth. Uh, also wrote the CDC and asked them to interview you. Oh, Center for Disease Control. They acknowledge my note, so we shall see. I'd love for you to share during National Anti-Fungus Day. It's actually Anti-Fungus Week. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, has totally honored me, and they have no idea who I am. We, we fly under the radar. We don't buy time on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, MSNBC. We don't. Um, rather, we go on, well, I think WGN is a huge network, and we're on WGN. We're on a Christian network called uh, T, uh, uh, CTM, Christian Television Network, a huge network, Dish and Direct, and other networks. Uh, and uh, thank you for contacting them. I've written them twice. I haven't heard back. But I know they're busy, and I know they're really good people, and I would love to interview a couple of their experts. October 1st through 4th, next uh, two weeks from now, uh, they have a week dedicated to understanding fungus. And you're not going to believe what they're saying, folks. They're saying on a little 90-second video, and it's so good, they're saying that, you know, get to a doctor if you have a fungal problem because fung fungus can mimic other diseases. Forty years ago I started saying that. And I was the biggest quack, Duck Kaufman. Uh, I was the biggest quack in the world, and today the Center for Disease Control is agreeing. I have spoken to two or th three or maybe four doctor groups, physicians, on cancer being intimately linked to fungus. It is. It's just that simple. Then can we prevent fungus? You bet. Stay away from the poisons they make. Air ducting systems, make sure you got a good air cleaner. Alcohol, I don't think there's any safe alcohol. Sorry. Uh, antibiotics, sometimes we need them, but they are fungus. Okay. Carrie, thank you. Beth, you rock. Uh, thank you for calling the CDC. I hope they do. Uh, what can we do for kids' ringworm, Crystal asked. Once again, folks, understand, because there's a lot of people here from YouTube today, um, understand I'm not a doctor. I can tell you what I would do, and I can tell you the skin doctors, the dermatologists I have worked with, what they might have done, but always check with the doctor. A ringworm is called worm and it grows in a ring, looks like a crusty ring, right? It's a little higher on the periphery. A ringworm is a fungus. So ringworm is contagious. It's one of those, you see, I think cancer can be contagious because ringworm is contagious. Maybe not all fungi, fungi are contagions, uh, but I think it can. I think men get prostate infections from women with yeast infections. I think differently. You'll see in a new book I'm now writing, really exciting, we're checking tonight, chapter seven. So we're almost done, halfway through that book, and it's blowing everybody that's reading its mind because I talk about that stuff. I talk about how we have to be very cautious and monogamous and you know how, how this stuff spreads. But at any rate, if I had a child with ringworm, a doctor is going to use either cortisone or Nizoral cream. 2%, I think, is what a pharmacy has. 1%, you can get at any pharmacy. You can walk in without a prescription and get Nizoral. Um, and there are other good uh, fungicidals, that means to kill, and fungistatins, that means to stop uh, fungus. But Nizoral, 1% cream. Uh, Crystal, do get to a doctor and have him, you don't have to do it, but see what he would do. If he's going to give you 2% uh, Nizoral, just ask the question. I know it, what's a pharmacy? Savon, CVS. I know CVS has 1%. Can I use that? Okay. Good for you. Okay, now, uh, Dorinda. 
If I have yeast skin due to 3.5 years on antibiotics for chronic ear infections, vertigo from my Kaiser HMO, used Iflucan for six months, does my husband need to use it too? You're probably asking what I was just talking about. Are you guys, my chapter is headed in the book, the female book. Are we passing this back and forth? Urinary tract infections anatomically are men with with dermatophytes, skin fungi, able to pass this to a bladder of a woman. They call it honeymoon cystitis. What does that conjure up? Driving in the country, riding horses? No, sex, honeymoon cystitis. And yet, boy, it's in medical settings. I think we're passing this back and forth. Um, so you got, okay, a skin yeast due to three and a half years of antibiotics. You're lucky you're alive. Chronic ear infections, vertigo. Um, I use six, I use Diflucan for six months. Does my husband need to use it too? So Diflucan is called fluconazole. It's now the one pill vaginal yeast cure. It used to just be an AIDS drug. So is it human immuno immunovirus or is it human immunofungus? More on that later, but that begs to be discussed. Um, is your husband symptomatic? Does it hurt when he sits down? Does it hurt when he urinates? Does your healthy, normal relationship hurt? Uh, if so, he may need to think about that. Now your question is a good one. Is he passing it to me? The question would be, after you're intimate with him, do you end up with a urinary tract infection or a vaginal yeast infection? You could be passing this back and forth. Throw your hands up. What do you do? You use a barrier. There's a lot of them sold. And you use it for a few months while he's taking something like resveratrol, which is a supplement you can get. Vitamin D3 just kills yeast beautifully. Uh, most things you'll walk into, zinc. Zinc not only kills fungus, it kills the poisons fungus makes also, called mycotoxins. So have him look into that. If you're having no problems being intimate and he's having no health problems, probably not. Thank you, Dorinda. Wow, lots of good questions. Look at you guys. Um, Debbie says, is IBS considered a chemical imbalance? I would have thought so. When I started today, an hour ago, I would have thought so. Folks, IBS stands for Irritable Bowel Syndrome. Do you love how they name a disease after the symptoms? Why? They only treat the symptoms. They don't know the cause. What could go awry in a gut with yeast, candida albicans, and billions of bacteria living together. What could go wrong in a gut? You kill the bacteria, droves of it. You notice, by the way, these poisons made by fungus cause the immune system to dip. So all of a sudden, every flu that comes up, I can't be around my niece anymore because she goes to school and she coughs and I end up with the infection. You know what I'm talking about. Um, chemical imbalance, I today tend to think of brain. I also believe that there are chemicals. When you, when you take apart our food, can't it contribute to a chemical balance or imbalance? Aren't probiotics balancing the microbiome of the gut? You bet they are. So uh, Deb, uh, if I can get Deb's uh, address, let me mail her our Fungus Link book. We did a whole chapter on gut problems. And then in the back, we have the diet that you need to follow. And we talk about probiotics. We talk about everything I've spoken here today about. I'm going to send you an early Christmas gift in hopes that you'll read that chapter on gut diseases induced by yeast and fungus and what you can do about them, Deb. I think, you know, by Christmas time, you'll be smiling ear to ear and probably by Halloween. Uh, okay, I've been told by my doctor that they can't test for fungus. Is there a specific lab? He's, okay, I need to go into that. Someone once told me when I drink my tea, I do this. It makes noise in my mic. I'm sorry about that, so I'm trying to be proper. I've been told by my doctor they can't test for fungus. I don't know where you are, Maria, but in Texas, I have had lunch several times, and I've lectured. I was the keynote speaker at a mycotoxicology meeting in Plano, Texas, uh, 2015 or 2016, and I met so many doctors there, and they heard about the fungus linked to cancer. And if you're me up on that podium, you cannot believe the mouths of the doctors and their wives. 
Let me read you something. Maybe I did earlier. I did. Are antibiotics carcinogens? Can antibiotics cause cancer? Certainly doctors would not believe such a risk exists for penicillin, an antibiotic given to billions of humans. However, it is by definition a mycotoxin, a fungal poison, and mycotoxins do cause cancer. Penicillin? So you have to understand what could go awry in the gut. Penicillin. Can it lead to IBS? You bet it can. Can a doctor test for it? The doctor who invited me, his name was Hooper, Dennis Hooper. He's an MD, PhD, really, really bright guy. He has a laboratory out here locally called Real Time Labs, and they can test your tissue, the breast lump. If I went in for a biopsy, I'd say, folks, you have to understand when a doctor orders a biopsy, he's got a little chit, C H I T, and he checks, test it for cancer, and off it goes to the pathology lab. They don't test it for anything else, they just test it for cancer. What's cancer? Well, we don't totally know, but we're going to check it for it. With a different stain or with a different technique, it often, it, uh, it, it often needs to be grown out on a petri dish over a series of many days. It's called culturing uh, fungus. You can identify it. Oh my gosh, she's got aspergillus, uh, you know, where I did that lab test on her. She's got aspergillus growing in her elbow. I think many lung cancers are totally misdiagnosed. Oh, it looks on MRI exactly like cancer. It's a lump in your chest. Oh, did you smoke? Yeah, when I was a kid, you got cancer. Hold on. I live in a moldy house now. I've been drinking a lot of alcohol. Could that come? No, no, it's cancer. Think through, folks. So if I was to get a biopsy, I would have half of it sent to test for cancer, and I'd send the other half, I'd call this lab, real-time labs. I think they're one of the few in the country that do mycology testing. Most hospitals say they do mycology testing, but that merely means they test for candida, which is any yeast is a single-celled fungus. Uh, fungi are pretty complex organisms, but yeast are one-celled organisms. So your doctor is partially right. If you don't learn about this in medical training, and I guess this is a pretty good way to wrap up this week. Um, when your doctor went to medical school, all of them have to take years of microbiology. Huge course, and it covers germs. For you and me, germology. Micro is tiny, tiny organisms that can cause harm, can cause disease. Because there are thousands of antibiotics in the dispensaries, in the pharmacies, they learn that much about bacteriology. Oh, there's what, 140 uh, antivirals. So they learn that much about virus. And there's what, six, 10, 14 antifungals. They learn very little about it. So those of you needing to share this information with your doctor, on my webpage, my homepage, knowthecause.com, over in the right-hand corner, doctor's fungal guide. So he'll know how to prescribe, when to prescribe and the dose to prescribe. Print those two pages off. It's referenced from the CDC and scientific literature. And just take it to your doctor and say, you know, you've been treating me for seven years for this bronchial problem or this skin problem with antibiotics and steroids. Could we try antifungals? Let me tell you in closing today what he or she won't tell you. I'll give you the nice statin and the diflucan if you'll follow Kaufman One Diet. Fungi must eat in order to thrive. If they don't get grains and sugar and beer and wine, they begin dying. Eat what fungi don't. Get the Diflucan and Nystatin prescriptions, try them for a month, along with my diet, and I think you'll reach right through that computer and high-five me in a couple of weeks. I've really enjoyed this. God bless you guys. I'll see you back here Tuesday, next Tuesday, at 3 p.m., 3 to 4. God bless. Bye-bye.